I'm John Barron, the author of the book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. You've just seen the movie. We're here in Savannah still, and for the next few minutes, we're going to go around and meet some of the real people behind the characters in the book and the movie. Well, my name is Luther Driggers. And yes, I do have a bottle of poison, the one mentioned by John Barrett. And it's put up in a safe place. I said, do you want me to clear up that business about you saying you're going to poison the water? Hell no, he said. He said, you just tell him I still got the poison. I don't live there anymore. Don't drink the water. <laughs> what was in the vial? It's uh, monofluorosodium acetate. It's 500 times more more uh, poisonous than cyanide. Well, he says it's enough poison to kill everybody in the county. Uh. It would wipe out a great portion of this city if it ever made it into the water supply. <laughs> I said, did you really say that? He said, well, yeah, I'll say just about anything when I've had a couple of drinks too many. Now, what is the story with the guy with the horsefly epaulets? Oh, uh, Luther Diggers. We had a ready supply in the government laboratory of these insects. And as I was doing bona fide research with them. He's a genius. My casual moments, I toyed around with them. And I would just take a piece of thread, a little bit of super glue on the abdomen, and touch the thread to it. And that's how it would attach to the fly. <laughs> and they would fly around the room, or I could hold them, or tie them to my buttons. They would fly around my head. They were fun. It was just an amusing thing to do, that's all. Some mornings I would come in and realize that I wouldn't be able to handle breakfast, so I, I might drink something, but I wouldn't eat my breakfast. Well, this caused, I wouldn't say concerns much, maybe concern, but certainly curiosity among the other patrons. And some thought that perhaps I had these demons bothering me inside, which perhaps I did. And they knew that I had this bottle of poison, and maybe they thought that something was wrong with the food, and maybe they shouldn't eat their breakfast. <laughs> Luther's not eating. If he eats and it's a good day, fine. If he doesn't eat, well, let's just put it this way. If I were you, I wouldn't drink the water today. When you come to Savannah, it's all right to drink the water here. It's safe. I drink it. We love to sit out here in the rain and gossip. That's what we do best here in Savannah. Talk about ourselves, talk about our friends, even about people we don't know. She's a he. Correct. You're shitting me. Nope. If this thing heats up, I think you're going to want to talk to her, Sonny. But if we could just keep that between us. Sure, sure. There was no gunpowder on that boy's hands. That means he couldn't have fired the gun, as Jim claims. Good Lord. And the location of the bullet wounds seems to be at odds with Mr. Williams' scenario of self-defense. You know, they say in Savannah there are three ways to get information out. One is the telephone, the other one is the telegraph, and the other one is the tell John. My late husband blew his brains out with one of those. <laughs> so did mine. What? Yeah, I was fixing myself a drink and Gunsmoke was on TV and I heard a shot. I thought it was part of the show till I walked in and there was Lyman bleeding, sprawled in his favorite chair. And you know, everyone knew our marriage was a disaster. And I'd so much as touch that gun, they'd have charged me with murder. <laughs> <laughs> Saving face in the light of unpleasant circumstances, it's the Savannah way. Is that true? Do you believe that? I've lived here a long time, honey. I believe most anything about anybody. How'd you know my name? Welcome to Savannah. Well, the shooting occurred in 81. I was involved with it for eight years. It's going to be rather sticky for Jim. How so? 
One entered the chest. The second bullet hit the boy in the back. And the third, well, the third bullet. He was convicted in the first trial. The Supreme Court reversed that, ordered a new trial. And during that period of time, Mr. Williams um, decided that he would like to have me on the defense team. So it was like a long play. I ended up uh, with the whole shooting match, no pun intended. Sonny Siler invented the OJ defense, which is not that you defend the defendant, but that you try the police department. I saw the police cars and I went inside and there was glass all over the floor and they were putting a pencil in a bullet hole. So Jim asked me to take my camera out and start photographing. Jim's mental ability to deal with a situation like being in jail was simply amazing. He used his time, he continued to carry on his business, he bought and sold antiques. He had disciplined himself not to think about the case. He was absolutely sure that he would be ultimately acquitted. I can't imagine having a better client. Surprisingly enough, he didn't bug us. Uh, we reported to him religiously. He put a lot of faith and trust in his attorney, so we made a good team. It was difficult to get Jim Williams to sit down long enough to prepare him for a trial. When he was in, uh, incarcerated, I went up there and did his hair. After the third trial, uh, we got a telephone call from a juror who wanted to tell us that we had done a good job in proving that the police had not secured what they called the crime scene. This juror remarked that if they had really sincerely secured the crime scene, they would not have let Mr. Williams' cat stay in the room and meander through all of the evidence. Then in trial four, we picked up on what this juror had observed and we postured with the jury, have you ever seen a cat jump up on a desk and switch its tail one time? There goes the minuscule particles of paper. And it worked quite well. The jury passed that around and when they discovered the cat, they started to smile one by one and I felt pretty good about it at that stage. When Billy got high, he could be very, very hostile. <laughs> You, Jim, you don't give me warnings, I give them to you, remember, because I can back mine up. His background, we did a thorough investigation on that and presented a lot of uh, evidence on uh, his propensity for violence and the type of person that he was. Hell, I'd have shot Danny Hansford myself. I know I'm going to regret asking this, but that man said he was walking a dog. Mm-hmm. What dog? Well, Mr. Glover was the law firm porter. One of the jobs that he had that he enjoyed doing is walking this black Labrador that was owned by our senior partner, Mr. Johnny Bowen. Mr. Bowen left instructions in his will that Mr. Glover should continue to be paid $15 every week for walking Patrick, his Labrador. So, where's Patrick? He said, Patty passed away. Well, Mr. Lawrence had $15 folded up in his hand. He said, well, how are you going to earn this $15? He said, he hadn't gone away again. He said, isn't that standing, in, standing right there by you? He said, I believe he is, Miss Lawrence. Time for me to watch, walk him. And he took the $15 and then left the building. And from that point on, he collected $15 until he too went on to his reward. The undiscovered jewel of the South, totally. You kind of got caught under that spell once you ever met Joe Odom. Joe was an incurable collector and had beautiful things, and all those houses became designer showcases. You just wait till you see my new house. I said, oh, Joe, what have you done? Afraid that he'd just moved in somewhere without letting somebody know it. So I said, he said, oh, just wait. It's the best house I've ever had. So I got up here, and we round in the corner on Abercorn Street to Lafayette Square. And I looked all around at all the little houses. He says, no, that one. And when I saw this four-story, towering, beautiful mansion, I went, uh-uh. <laughs> he said, yeah, it's Cousin Buzz's, and we're moving in. Squat? Woo! Now, that's a vicious word. You're not a lawyer, are you? No, 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 no. Good. Well, Joe was a very fine lawyer. He could have been a better lawyer, but uh, he was a musician and finally decided that uh, he wanted to run that side of the street. I was
was in one ballroom and the infamous Joe Odom was in another, mutual friends said to me, have you met that piano player, that rich lawyer from Savannah, the one that's made so much money in practicing law, he just plays the piano for fun? I said, well, no. Lives in one of those big historic houses. You need to meet him. Y'all y'all sing a lot alike. You sing the same stuff. You sing all that old stuff, that Mercer stuff and all that music. You, y'all, you need to meet. Well, we did. And then two months after that, he says, we need to have our own club in Savannah, Georgia. And of course, I told him, well, we, I don't have any money. You know, how are we going to open a club? Because I found out that he didn't have all that much money either. And he said, well, we're going to use what I call OPM. And I just got my real estate license, and I thought that was probably some new mortgage plan that I hadn't heard of. It actually stands for other people's money. So uh, we opened the bar, and it was a success, and that's how it all started. Well, life was for the living at Joe's. It's always a party, a 24-hour party. The tourists started coming at 10, the nightclub closed at 3, and that foot was tapping constantly. I don't know how I lived through it, to tell you the truth. Well, good afternoon. I'm Jerry Spence, and you get to meet me on page 47, but there's a lot of fun on 79 and 80. I'm the hairdresser to all the characters in the book. My friend John Barrett, after writing the novel and selling the screen rights, had said that the people would be screen tested to play themselves. This became quite an issue in Savannah. The first word is that I would be too old to betray my part. I thought, why? My character doesn't have an age limit on it. Jerry Spence. Hello, how are you? I'm charmed now. And the next day I got a phone call from John Barrett who said, I heard you made it in the movie. Jerry Spence, you have outdone yourself again. I found it very interesting. There's not a day that goes by that somebody doesn't ask me to sign their book. Well, I don't know. Jerry, what do you think? Great God. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only book that maybe they want the real characters and the real people to sign their book. I find that to be very interesting. One night she came through and Joe was talking to her and I noticed how attractive she was and I said, who was that really beautiful black girl that was in here that, that was, you know, he said, well, that's the Lady Chablis. I have a man's toolbox, but everything else about me is pure lady. I love to dress in women's clothes. I love to go shopping. I love to have my nails done and I love men. I do what uh, everybody tells me, like my, all of my good friends and my, my crew, they just tell me constantly, just be yourself. So it's easy. Chablis a pretty name. It's unusual. Why, thank you. Yeah, um, I got it off a wine bottle. It's a show name. You're an actress? No, I'm not an actress. I'm a showgirl. When I was offered the part, I was flattered. But just like uh, the book, Midnight, I never asked to be in that book, you know. The author saw my personality and included it. And I think the, that with Mr. Eastwood and the casting director, they saw my personality and decided the same thing. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh my God, nothing, honey. Oh, my empress is what you should say. Y'all been naked since I walked out on stage, honey. She's real hard to upstage. <laughs> like impossible. Oh. <laughs> he said, it's good, huh? I said, yeah, I had no idea that was a fella. I have nothing to hide and I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done. I think it's time you meet the most important member of my defense team. <laughs> Minerva is a genuine, real character. Jim had befriended her, took care of her to an extent. I think that they just really liked one another as friends. Minerva would sit out in Monterey Square uh, on the bench, and um, Jim would tell me that Minerva had the, all these powers and that she was going to put a hex on this and she was going to do that and the other. I said, hell, don't let her put any hex on us. So he wanted me to go meet her and talk to her. I said, listen, you handle the magic and I'll handle the law. Jim was a fun brother. 
to have. He was an entrepreneur in many ways, but when he was about 14, that's when he began to buy antiques. There was born uh, an antiques dealer for the rest of his life. This is the dagger that Prince Yusupov used to murder Rasputin. There was never a time uh, when he was not buying and selling and searching. Uh, for him, the search was really uh, a large part of what went on. Well, that's from Napoleon's coronation carriage. You have a most impressive collection. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Kelso, look around. It's not a collection, it's my home. Fabergé? Mm, I'm a minor enthusiast. Jim began uh, to have an interest in old houses again when he was very young. He bought his first series of three houses when he was, I think, 25. It was three Savannah Gray brick houses. He restored those, sold them, and then just began to move on. Mr. Williams restored this home, one of the many he saved from the wrecking ball. Jim was a real purist. Um, he wouldn't change anything. He used materials that were appropriate for these old houses. Uh, he wanted things to continue to live, if you will, whether they were houses or pieces of furniture. This is your house? Mm-hmm. Built by General Hugh Mercer in 1860, but he never lived in this house. His great-grandson was Johnny Mercer. The songwriter? Mm-hmm. Savannah's own. Mercer House, I consider uh, his masterpiece. This house is one of the largest houses in Savannah. It covers an entire block. He wrote at some point after he began this restoration that Mercer House really challenged his abilities. I'd never thought about that. But when you look at this wonderful old house, and it truly was a shambles when Jim bought it, then you can imagine what a challenge it was to put it back in shape again. Jim started restoration in 1969, and Jim actually lived in this house until his death. We love the house, we are comfortable here, we've spent lots of years in and around this house. See, our emerald bird has arrived. <laughs> oh, I'm just flying, Dr. Lee. Now, who is that magnificent creature? One of the most notorious, if not scandalous, characters in the book and the movie was Helen Drexel, a.k.a. Serena Dawes. She loved to uh, hold court uh, in her bed. I'd get out of bed for you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> she was outrageous. Literally. Maybe that's why I liked her so much. Her mother-in-law had talked her into doing a celebrity endorsement for Pond's Cold Cream and donating the money to charity. Now, all was fine and well until Serena found out that mom in law was doing the same thing and pocketing her money. And believe you me, there were fireworks thereafter. <laughs> I remember her very well. We were great friends. Great party. Great house. Jim loved to entertain, and this house really was built for entertaining. He finished the restoration of Mercer House in 1970 and held his first Christmas party in that year. Jim's Christmas parties were very elegant. Black tie, including I had to wear a black tie. The food at Jim's parties were, uh, was prepared by Lucille Wright, one of the finest caterers in Savannah. In fact, he would have me photograph her and her two boys before each party. Mr. Williams had wonderful Christmas parties, and it, the, the guests enjoyed his parties immensely. Uh, and it was a pleasure to serve them. Lucille, you have outdone yourself again this year. There's a scene in the movie that takes place at Jim's Christmas party, and all of us were very involved in planning that scene recreating, which is what we did. We sent out an invitation, did it uh, the way Jim would have done it. We decided that indeed our friends and Jim's friends, people who had been to the Christmas parties, were absolutely the appropriate guest uh, to have. And the house looked wonderful, uh, so it was very festive. 
It was a hell of a bash, Jim. You about done yourself. <laughs> No matter what you and I ever do in our lives, Mr. Kelso, neither of us will ever be as famous as Ugger. He's the university mascot, the Georgia Bulldog. We've been furnishing the Georgia mascot since I was a student in law school in 1956. Not all of the Georgia Bulldogs that they've ever had, but all of the Ugger line. Ugger 4 was perhaps um, the most active of all of the dogs. He is the mascot who went to the Heisman trophy banquet in New York in black tie with Herschel Walker and actually went to the to the banquet and was well received and probably better behaved than some of the people who were there. Ugga Five has been involved in a lot of projects. Sports Illustrated named him the top college mascot in the nation. You know I used to watch the Lassie movies and they always had in the credits that Lassie by herself or something like that. Well, we can't quite say that in this movie because we've got Ugga Five playing the role of his famous father, Ugga Four, so I guess it'll have to say, and Ugga Four by his son, Ugga Five. So if you find them anywhere where someone